this year, Princess Diana vented her anger on photographers. She's determined that her children will not suffer as she has at the hands of the media. Could I ask you to respect my children's space? Yes, sir. Yes. Because I brought the children out here for a holiday. Right. We've had 15 cameras following us today. As a parent, right. I want to protect children. Right. There was an exceptional amount of photographers and press there. Wherever she went, every minute of the day, she had them with her. They were cutting across her, for sitting virtually next to her on the ski lift. I mean, everywhere, the whole time, she was completely observed by them, and I think she found that very hard to cope with. Having the press follow her every move is an occupational hazard, even on an isolated Caribbean island. Wherever you go, or as soon as you get out of your car, you're being harassed at times, you know. I mean, that, that must be... I think she's justified to that point where she's being harassed every day on a day-to-day -day basis or followed in the car, whatever she does. But uh, I think sometimes you can't have it all... It's not all one-sided that you feel sorry for her because sometimes I think the message she gives to photographers can be a little bit mixed, you know. I mean, I, I don't c condone um, paparazzi's following. I don't like that, but I think sometimes she'll say one thing and yet her body language and her actions does another thing. So I do think photographers can be very confused as to what the message is she's giving. A certain amount of scrutiny, in her case it's a lot of scrutiny, but a certain amount of scrutiny is, goes with the territory and um, there is a way of handling it. She's learned a lot, and, but she's, she suddenly has mood swings where she'll suddenly put her hand over her face and, and uh, you know, play the prima donna. Far better to smile, and they will quickly go away once you've given them a picture. Out, out, out. Out, out, O-U-T, out. Have a nice trip, ma'am. Diana's powerful position as the mother of the future king has given her a platform on which to express her views. Once she stamped her foot on behalf of womankind, she became an icon praised by Camille Parlier and all feminists around the world. It's why she's become, quite rightly, an icon for feminism, whereas previously she was just some clothes peg, uh, famous because of who her husband was. But let's not forget, she's the daughter of a hereditary earl. When Diana is accused of wanting to destroy the monarchy, it's total nonsense. She believes in the hereditary principle. She wants her son to be king. She doesn't necessarily want her husband to be king, but she wants her son to be king. Diana's ancestral home is Althrop in Northamptonshire. She comes from one of Britain's oldest and noblest families. I think the Spencer family, which of course is a much more British and much older and more traditionally British family than the Windsors, um, probably does carry in its genes the grit and determination and stubbornness that Diana has quite rightly shown in being the first Princess of Wales in British history not to tolerate her husband having affairs. Diana grew up on the royal estate at Sandringham, where her father, John, was an equerry to King George VI. The marriage of her parents, the future Earl Spencer and Francis Fomoy, was a grand affair attended by the Queen. But the marriage was not destined to last. There were four children, seemed a very happy family. She was six when her mother, known now as Mrs Shankid, fell in love with someone else and left the children and the home to marry this man. That marriage has since broken up. Diana's resemblance to her mother is striking, but she does not want her children to experience the traumas of a broken marriage the way she did. Diana has never forgotten that, and that sort of emotional deprivation. So perhaps because of that, she indulges in what might be called smother love with Prince William and Prince Harry almost too much. I mean, there is a little worry there that she may lavish too much affection on them. She is tactile, loving, demonstrative. She cuddles these boys in public. She has told them it's not a crime to cry. She is just so different. And, of course, I think Prince Charles viewed this 
um, with a certain wariness. And uh, she has told the boys that their father at times may be rather remote, and they mustn't worry about this, but it's because of his emotionally stunted childhood that he can't always communicate. And they both recognised, both Prince Charles and Princess of Wales, that because they lacked mother love as children, that they've been emotionally deprived and was one of the problems in their marriage. Charles had a very difficult childhood. He grew up more or less having to look after himself and see to himself. He became enormously self-sufficient. He seemed not to need anyone. He had nannies, of course, but he's grown up in this way to not need women, not need a mother. Where he was brought up as a, as a baby, he was made to believe he was the one. I mean, his pram was polished twice a day, like one of those wonderful Rolls Royces. Um, he was the one, and, and he's been brought up like that all his life, so it's very difficult for him to suddenly, uh, you know, ha have a lot of humility. Charles's early years with his sister, Anne, appeared idyllic. I always think that Anne should have been the boy and Charles should have been the girl. He was a, he's a very sensitive little boy and not rambustuous like his sister. Charles and Anne used to fight like mad because she, she's a strong character and if they both wanted to play with the same toy, she won. They went out one day picking mushrooms or something and they ended up punching each other. And the Queen had to sort of separate them. <laughs> Nanny Lightbody, who, who, who looked after Charles, just adored him just absolutely worshipped him and she had it was the nanny father relationship she, she she and prince philip fell out over over the way charles should be brought up prince philip felt that he should be brought up in a slightly tougher way and when 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 he used to go to parties children's parties charles would hold on to nana's leg nanny was more important to him than his own mother and um, nana as he calls mabel anderson uh, was absolutely the light of his life. And you know it is said that the reason he finds Mrs. Camilla Parker Bowles so important in his life is that she is slightly a nanny figure to him, warm and comforting. When Prince William was born, Diana was quick to assert her influence. You know, he couldn't understand the Princess of Wales when she wanted to bring up her children herself. He thought, one always hands a child over to Nanny, you know, and such a wonderful Nanny as Mabel. I mean, he's, he's quite bewildered that Diana would want to be a real mother. Diana insisted that the baby William accompanied them on an official visit to Australia shortly after his birth. And she was determined that Prince William was not going to be a little stranger to her. And she broke all rules, it was consternation, and the Queen eventually had to agree because this very strong-spirited, strong-willed young woman was determined to take her baby with her to Australia. And of course, it was tremendous, and the bonding continued, mother and son. Relaxed family holidays were an important part of Diana's calendar and the Waleses were regular guests of the Spanish royal family. Prince Harry's first day at school was a taster of the public's attention he and his brother William would be subject to. Harry's a younger lad, he's impish, he has a dry sense of humour, uh, he's a bit of a scallywag, and he runs rings round Prince William. William's rather more ponderous, uh, rather more sober, rather more dutiful. I think William takes after the princess in his looks, definitely. He's so much like her in his, his face, his height, his figure, and his mannerisms, his, his sense of humour. He giggles and, and he's got a good sense of humour like her. 
but I think the serious side of him is very much like his father. After her official separation from Charles, Diana appeared at family gatherings as a princess alone. This was the wedding of Princess Margaret's son, David Lord Linley, to Serena Stanhope. Away from the spotlight, a new generation of royalty had grown up and made a life for themselves outside the palace walls. Viscount Linley had to have a profession because he's not directly in line to the throne. They keep a low profile because, frankly, I don't think the press is quite as interested in them unless they go and do something terrible in a nightclub somewhere. I mean, if Viscount Linley ever had a, a night off with, a, with um, another woman, believe me, his quiet way of life would vanish. They would be in the next day's headlines. They, they can get on with their own lives. They have their own jobs. They both, I mean, Linley has a very successful business and his sister is a very successful artist. Uh, and they're not obliged to make public appearances or do anything like that. Princess Margaret's children, David and Sarah, survived the breakup of their parents' marriage extremely well. They had a wonderful nanny, Nanny Sumner, who, who kind of kept the, the stability in that family, even though Margaret was incredibly unhappy. Um, and Sarah is a daddy's girl, really. She's very close to her father. and and Lord Linley is very close to his mother. I think Princess Margaret is thrilled w with the way that those children have turned out. They both seem to be very happily married. They actually seem to have come out of it remarkably well. And I, I think it probably does have a lot to do with, with, with their upbringing. It was very stable and nearly every holiday, Sarah Armstrong Jones spent with Princess Anne down at Yatcombe. The Queen had them whenever she could. So they've always had this tight sort of family unity and there was never the sort of being palmed off on other people. <laughs> Princess Anne has been careful to keep her children out of the limelight. She refused to allow them titles and likes to stress that they are ordinary people whose aunt just happens to be the queen. Zara is 14. A schoolgirl like any other, she loves horses and gymnastics. Princess Anne has really got it right. And she stood out for what she believed. The Queen really t wanted her to take titles for those children. And she said no, because she sort of almost could have, it's almost as if she, she foresaw what was going to happen. There was no fuss and frills. They, weren't, they didn't have detectives around them all the time. I mean, this is because, probably because Anne put a foot down and said this is how they're going to be brought up. And they had very, very much a sort of loving family. Like Peter's already got a girlfriend. He's a very good-looking boy. Um, he's, a, he's a very much of a sort of countryman. He's a, he's a very good shot. He's a very good rider. <laughs> he is the Queen's favourite grandchild, we're told, and Prince Philip dotes on him. Perhaps because he's the eldest, he's the first one, and that's natural in families. You make a big fuss about the first grandchild. But he's lived up to all their expectations. He's done very well. He's a great rugger player, and now he's going to the Marines. I think he'll, he'll do so well, and he will get on with his life quietly. He'll probably have a very happy life doing a very useful job. The older royal children have coped well with the breakup of their parents' marriages. But what does the future hold for the Duke and Duchess of York's children? I suppose that uh, the first thing that went wrong, uh, not necessarily in their marriage, but in the way that they were addressing the upbringing of their children, was when Fergie went to Australia to find Andrew, who had not come to the birth. He had not been able to get leave from the Navy. I find that very difficult to understand because it's a compassionate leave and I'm quite sure that the family could have um, pulled a little weight on his behalf. But for one reason or another, he didn't go to the birth. Maybe she suspected at that time that the marriage really wasn't very strong and uh, she felt that her duty to her marriage came before her duty to her daughter. And uh, perhaps it did, but in the event, of course, it didn't because what has happened is that uh, Beatrice was not able to bond with her mother at a very, very critical time 
in her early development. And although uh, Sarah Ferguson is making it up to her now, and making it up to Eugenie as well, who was born only a year later, by giving both of them the contents of a toy shop, um, it's not enough, you see. It's not enough to compensate for the loving attentions that uh, every child needs right from the moment it's born. Royal marriage is supposed to be a great love match and everybody's supposed to live happily ever after and everybody's been reading fairy stories if they believe that. And I think they are not only as affected as any other child of a broken marriage, but they have to put that damn stiff upper lip on it and appear in public as if they're perfectly normal people when they might have turmoil going on inside. I mean, heaven knows what the result is going to be for William and Harry of this particular breakup or of the uh, two York princesses. William was very traumatized by it. He, he just hated the idea of his mother being so unhappy uh, and he sort of took the burden of, of guilt upon him. Harry sailed through it easier because he was younger and he had William to protect him. Well, we've read tales of um, William being very disturbed by his mother's tears and offering a Kleenex to mop, up, mop them up. Um, I think being older, he's, he's much more conscious of what a separation means. And as Prince Charles has said, he reads the newspapers and he is therefore, he said you can't protect them from that. And he's often disturbed by distorted tales in the press. I remember there were, when there were furore about Princess Diana's uh, going topless or being photographed topless in Spain, he rang her up. I, I, know, I know he did because she, she, she said. And he said, Mummy, it's not true, is it? And she said, of course it's not true, William. But, you know, he was really worried about that because, you know, he's, a, he's an adolescent and, and that sort of thing, probably her being topless would worry him far more than some story about, about their father, which he'd say, well, that's rubbish. The fact that their parents no longer fight and scream at each other uh, and are, are civilised in their behaviour towards it has got to be better for the children, so they're much better adjusted now. But I think they did have a bumpy period, and you can see in William's face um, his anger at the media, which I think is a shame, but you can see it when you look at him and you look at him being photographed, you can see how he hates them, so he's probably transferred quite a lot of the blame onto them. William is having to learn to live with the press, but like his mother, he finds their excesses hard to tolerate and understand. Say on his skiing holiday when he, he appears at the bottom of the mountain, and there might be 30 great big strapping men with you know woolly hats pulled down over their faces. I mean, they look a bit sort of almost like terrorists at times. They look, they've all got big scarves around their faces and these great big lenses. And I mean, it's quite a frightening scene for a young boy to uh, cope with. And I think he's found it quite hard. But in, in um, I'd say in the last year, he's He's growing up a little bit and he's learning that he has to accept it and he's trying very hard to, to cope with it, but I th don't think he's finding it easy. At his first impromptu press conference, William took charge of his brother and young cousins Beatrice and Eugenie. Good. Good fun. Improving, you see, very good. They're improving. Very good skills. Richard, sorry, could you ask around here? Sorry. Rob, we should sorry. very much. William, do you hope to have a school together at some point? Um, yes, it'll be good fun. It'll be very good. Enjoy it. One more minute and we'll call it back. Thank you. Can you look this way? Hello. You're right, Eugenie. Beatrice, you're right. Harry is made of tougher material in, in respect that he, he seems a lot more laid back. It doesn't seem to worry him as much. He's, he, he seems a lot happier with crowds of people around him and doesn't seem so bothered by people observing him. He seems to take it in his stride and just gets on with what he's doing. I mean, sometimes he'll react to the photographers. He'll, his way of coping with it is he'll pick up a snowball and throw it at a photographer and laugh. Whereas perhaps William will, will, will he, he can't see the funny side in that, he gets too upset by it. Whereas Harry would, will, will cope with it in that way. All right. All right. Oh. Yeah.
on holiday with their father, William and Harry face the press yet again. But behind the happy smiles lies a sadness that they cannot enjoy family life all together. Princess Diana has been subtly, and not so subtly, moved to the margins of the monarchy. She's been disenfranchised as a mother. Prince Charles has hired, effectively, a surrogate mother, a lady called Tiggy Leg Burke, to arrange the outings for the boys, to play with the boys when, when he has the boys for weekends and for school holidays. So Diana watches that, those activities with mounting frustration and, and anger. At the same time, the boys are getting older, and as every parent knows, once a boy reach, reaches teenage years, he, he tends to go towards his father and f towards his father's pursuits, and that's precisely what's happening with William. William's first day at Eton College. Diana has asserted her influence once again. Her family have always sent their sons to Eton. Eton is as good a public school as any for uh, the royal princes to go to. My personal belief is that the British education system, the public education state system, would be much better if the royal family used it. Other European monarchies conspicuously use the state education system, and I would like to have seen William and Harry go to a state school. At least poor little Prince William is not being sent to Gordonston. There's probably been a family battle about that. And the princess has always said, I've taken William and Harry uh, with me on engagements wherever possible to see down and outs, you know, see the homeless. And she said, I desperately want them to know about the real world and not to live a life surrounded by flunkies and velvet. One of the reasons why Princess Diana stays as a semi-detached member of the royal family is to really groom Prince William for his future destiny as a King of England. She wanted to see a rather more relaxed, informal monarchy for the 21st century. But Diana is unlikely to have things entirely her own way. These days, those who have seen William grow over the last few years say that the prince is now following very much in his father's footsteps. He has the Windsor stance, the Windsor manner mannerisms, even the Windsor temper. William is being groomed very much in the Windsor mould, so that if Queen Victoria came back to, to Earth today, she would see that William is being, he's going to Eton, he's hunting, shooting and fishing, and so those who feel that William will be a refreshing, uh, informal monarch will find that he's just very much in the mould of his father. William more than Charles faces the task of modernising the monarchy, but he's already under pressure from the conflicting influences of his strong-willed parents. I think they're already finding it difficult to live in the royal straitjacket. Allegedly, William was quoted recently as saying that, he said, why can't I be ordinary? Why can't I be like other boys? If you're a teenage boy, you just want to be like other children your own age. You, you want to be one of the gang, and you don't want to stand out in any way. Now, this is the, the sad thing about William and Harry. They do stand out. They are different. There's no two ways about that, and they must learn to live with it. The quicker they do, the happier they'll be. Now, Harry seems well-adjusted, and it doesn't bother him too much, but, of course, the main burden doesn't fall on Harry. William is much more like his father, very sensitive and very conscious of what goes on around him and of what lies ahead. And therefore, you can see this heavy burden falling on these young shoulders. It's, it's quite touching, really.